Uh, we are we've, we've close to testing uh, more than fifty people now. Um, wow. And uh, we've we've basically isolated the different mechanisms of people who become violent in the state of an appetitive aggression way, which is where this rewarding type of violence. And then how do they believe when we are put them, we're putting them in this um, situation where they they are allowed to become violent in a retaliatory way. Lights, Camera, Azadi is a show that is on a quest to meet personalities. The personalities who have always challenged the status quo. These people are courageous and confident to speak the truth and are the best at it. Though the world may or may not agree with them, they always work for nation building. We want to talk to them and understand their perspective. We want to know their world view, their thoughts and what gaps do they see in the society and most importantly, how to live life fearlessly. My name is Vandit Jain and I am just a medium to get these stories to you. Welcome to part 2 of the science behind extremism. Well, if you have come this far, that means you are curious to know more and you have enjoyed part 1. Um, I welcome you to this episode and uh, all I can tell you is this episode is going to be one hell of a ride. So, fasten your seat belts, get ready and let's go straight to where we left off. Is there any reason uh, uh, why people are attracted to a certain ideology and some people are attracted to certain ideology? I mean, do our early experiences, our childhood experiences uh, have a very definite, uh, you know, a direction to what our political leanings will be when we grow up? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, identity and community are, is a big part of um, our political ideology. If you have been and especially in the critical years of your life in particular and this is not a single answer for everybody everybody has a different reason uh but a lot of people now especially a lot of people do get um uh, sidelined or feel that they are at the periphery of the mainstream narrative that is becoming increasingly um popular uh, to be on the periphery if you're a minority if you are uh, what from the lgbtqa community if you are even a woman as a as a specific gender you can be feel left out um, from the mainstream narrative and that can make you feel like you're sidelined and then you have an ideology to hold on to because that's when you feel like you are accepted more than anything and once you are and there are specific like three to four stages in the way that you can be brainwashed and the final stage is where you would do absolutely anything um for the organization or the ideology without questioning anything in the first two three stages you are still questioning and trying to establish your um your um, position in the organization or in the in how deep you are in the ideology um but at, after a certain point in time you stop questioning and 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 the people who recruit um uh p- other people for into ideologies or even political ideologies it doesn't have to be a violent ideology it could be any ideology uh, a specific idea around politics or gender um they know who exactly um will be prepared to do whatever the the organization would want of them one of the person i was speaking with he was the main recruiter for the nazis in the 90s uh and he understood wow. the distinction from who would be willing to engage in violent crimes and who would not be who would be the leadership kind and there are all sorts of people in the organization i mean right now the consensus is that everybody who travels to syria and join isis is a terrorist but if a lot of people in isis are some people might be accountants and bankers and just looking after the the everyday you know uh no, the operations the social media handle absolutely <laughs> um bus <laughs> drivers also marketing expert at isis <laughs> absolutely so and they are by default terrorists because isis is a terrorist organization uh but uh you have to see that not all of those people engage in violence and the videos that we see the videos that horrify us on social media are the ones that are put at the front the ones that are picked up from the highest cadres of their organization as the ones to conduct these specific crimes and those are the violent terrorists that we should be chasing who are they why are they like that and once we understand that's when you know all this process of de-radicalization 
that is happening all across the world. They're just for putting all sorts of radicals in the same room and working on them in one way or another. Um, that's a different type of working that we need on a radical versus another type of working that we need on a radical who is prepared to die or take life or blow a bomb. You know, it's so so we we don't understand those differences, and it is very important that we do. And there is no other way to understand it other other than using your own, um, you know, using research in the brain. Um, the economics, the politics would not be able to answer that. This, this, uh, there's another common consensus was that uh, people from low socioeconomic backgrounds only become terrorists because they don't have anything else to go to. But that's wrong as well. Um, you know, the, the guy who killed these people in Bombay, in the Taj, um, Kasab, he was from low socioeconomic backgrounds, so sure. But the guys who blew up uh, public places and churches in Sri Lanka, they were mostly wealthy people. Now, the, you know, no economic class or social class or political class or ideology has been able to determine who will become violent and who will not. Um, and uh, I think all of that knowledge is important, but it has to be put together with a biggest missing puzzle that is, um, you know, the research in the brain. And, and that's what I am trying to do at the moment. You mentioned about four stages of brainwashing. Uh, can you throw some light there? So this is um, like um, ISIS had uh, described this really well. Um, uh, you know, you know, it's three stages in ISIS in particular. Um, uh, so one is basically you believe that um, uh, you know there is no other god except for uh, Allah, and then um, th- then uh, the second one is like all your um uh, support or solidarity should be always towards the muslims uh, and then anything else af- around it anything else outside of that then that becomes your enemy so so there are like these pillars of um the foundations of the organization mm-hmm. uh, that you can say and and then you know the, the third one is where um the brainwashing is to such an extent that anything beyond uh, the words of um, the Allah, which is like outside uh, the Quran or the teachings, um, becomes, you know, a sin in a way. It becomes a, like you, you should not be believing it an outside structure that has a certain type of political power. So things, simple things like having a bank account outside of the Islamic state or having uh, the right to vote, uh, you know, you know, using simple civil services become a sin. And that's when, um, and, 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 and the only inclusive um, community is, is the Muslim community within the ISIS. I mean, you would have noticed that and that the majority of the people who have been affected by ISIS are actually Muslims because their problem is not so much with the non-Muslim. Their problem is more with the Muslims who are not the right kind of Muslims. And right as per them. Right as per them, absolutely. And the, they absolutely hate that those people exist and that's where a lot of the problems are happening in the in the region and of course they've been doing all sorts of things outside in the europe and the us as well but this this is their biggest problem so so their version of islam is the very standardized very concrete distinct one, version of conservative religion that they want to put forward but that's just one method uh you know, and we could translate this to, I'm not going to worry too much about the neo-Nazis because we've been talking enough about them, but going back to India and how it is, I mean, how deep does the person needs to be in the, in the, you know, far, far right terrorist organizations? Um, India doesn't call them as terrorist organization, but the people who advocate for violence in the organizations and, and does all sorts of things. Like, for example, the guy that I met was a Bajang, it was a Bajang the leader. Now, if those guys have killed a certain number of people or his group, um, you know, how deep do you have to be in the organization to act in a certain way? Um, and, uh, and of course there could be lone wolf terrorists all the time. Uh, and they could, you know, they would be associating with an ideology, but not actually a part of the organization. Um, but you have to be really deep in certain organization to act, um, in a certain way. Um, on the basis of some instructions given from the top down. 
Um, mm. Yeah. I think there, there was a really good book on it. And I, um, I and there was a talking about basically the rise of um, ISIS, uh, the rise of RSS from the nineties onwards. And they depicted all sorts of uh, um, uh, generalistic VHP organizations um, uh, like the larger Hindu organizations in India. And most of them were actually not violent. And there's some, there was some, uh, violent uh, organizations that has its members engaging in violent crimes. And I think those other people might have an impact on democracy and the political processes, sure. But our biggest problem is people willing to take each other's lives on the names of religion and identity. And if you could just stop that, that would be a big victory. And then we can look at the democracy afterwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll just take a step back uh- you mentioned about two points uh, when we were talking about the stages of uh, brainwashing in ISIS. Uh, one is that uh, there is no other God but one true God, which is Allah. And anybody apart from Muslims is essentially a kafir. And now m- my question is that aren't these teachings not just there in ISIS, but you would see these teachings in a lot of uh, you know, some a lot of sections in the Muslim community here in India as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are lots of teachings in the Bible, likewise, and there are lots of teachings in. I mean, our religious texts in general are filled with violence and bravery of certain people and how there were wars. I mean, Bible has it's it's mostly talking about wars. Yeah, you know, they're they're mostly talking about people. You know, you defeat the enemy. Um, in some sort of way and the enemies the other person uh, there's all it's like always a black and white one-sided story we never question you know i mean and rome was rome was not built in one day and then the europe was not built in one day either it was based on you know these ancient christian values and those things have those values have changed over a period of time people don't follow the bible or the quran you know, word to word in the way that it's been written, because people understand that these things are based on a context that was back then. You know, the back then, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, people did get married to super young women, and I'm not advocating that in any way. Of course, it's terrible, but we did not have the same type of morality as we have now. I mean, now there are so many Muslims um, who even accept. Um, uh, uh, homosexual couples in their families and we have one um, and uh, things are changing now so be- people look at read the, but the, the Quran is so um, talked about because of the the, the sheer um, uh, you know discussion of Islamic terrorism of course because of the rate of the incidence of Islamic terrorism are much higher um, in the in the general world uh, in the last decade or two but uh, it, the Quran has been read upon in such a way that um, most people think that every Muslim should be believing in whatever is written in the Quran and would be following it without questioning from A to Z, um, without the context. But it's never about, you know, for Muslims, it's always about the context. When, if they're reading it, that doesn't mean it's happening in their day-to-day lives. Um, uh, as as and when, I mean, of course, they would go back for certain uh, rules uh, like family um uh what do you say the the distribution of wealth in the family you know who gets what and things like that but even those things are not counted for in the same way these days but every muslim don't doesn't practice the same type of religion as the isis version of religion is and every christian doesn't practice the same type of catholicism there are so many different sects of it and even with hinduism there's just there's no specific book you could pretty much do anything and be called a Hindu um, as long as you belong to that region. Um, so I think the people believe that because the teaching is so structured and so rigid, most Muslims would be like that. But actually, I mean, there's also another hadith in Islam uh, that if you live in the country, you it is, um, it is obliged for you as a Muslim to follow the rules of the country. Now, yeah. that hadith is one thing, and then it goes over another thing that people talk about the Sharia law. The Sharia law was supposed to be, you know, I'm, and I'm not advocating it at all. I think it's a horrific thing to have those barbaric laws, but, um, it, you know, the, 
the, the laws are for those specific times uh, when there was a certain type of people around. And, and now, I mean, if, if Muslims are thinking that they could have it in, in countries with democracies, they are delusional. Um, um, so, so you know, it, but 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 for non-Muslims who don't understand these things, these are very contextual things, and and people are so conflicted when it comes to religion. I mean, we're talking about human behaviors here. They could believe something, but not actually practice it, and that happens all the time, not just with Muslims. Um, but but people are always conflicted. I mean, in Muslims, it's also haram to watch TV, but does that happen? <laughs> you know, so it's because because you're essentially you know entertaining yourself with um, uh, all these things that you're not supposed to um, watch but but tv never existed before so i mean a lot of people do do give themselves a little leeway when it comes to these things and i think it's it's unfair to kind of assume that every muslim would behave exactly in the same way i think i i get a lot because of my surname uh, when i criticize something that is um, that is, um, you know, from India or for somewhere else, people think that I must be an Islamist. And th- and this, there's just no space for nuance there because of my surname, I must be an Islamist. And I think that's, that's a terrifying thought, uh, that people think so black and white, um, because that's not the case with a lot of people. True. And, you know, to add to your point, I do believe that I th- Religion was supposed to be the guiding light back in those times because, uh, you know, probably the moral, the, the morals were very different back then. And probably religion was that moral code, uh, that can give people the right, uh, give people in society the right direction. But I think what really happened in the past few hundred years or so, or maybe more that it sort of lost track and uh, it, it got hijacked by, yeah, you know, probably purists and radicals, and it it sort of took a very different turn. What what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, um, so but I I think of Islam as a very successful anti-slavery movement because um, even now slavery is kind of rampant in um, in the Middle East, and it's only it's one of the few places in the world that has this type of slavery, uh, or the culture of slavery is still there um, um so even if they're economically like employing um the mindset is still of the master and the slave master and slave yeah, yeah. so and in in back then i think the sl- to the extent of slave trade was so much like it was it was almost like deeply embedded in the culture of that region in the middle east in the arab culture and it came off as a uh, uh, Islamic movements back then came off as a very successful anti-slavery movements. I mean, one of the highest um, rewards or spiritual rewards given to a person in Islam is freeing a slave. <laughs> there is no better way to redeem yourself except freeing a slave. And and those those um, laws or uh, rewards that kept happening uh, throughout um, the Islamic period were. Uh, were for the betterment of the slaves, and because of because of those uh, uh, incidences, a lot of slaves joined Islam, and and from there it kind of grew. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I look at it as as a movement that was ridiculously successful in one way or another um, in that context, in that specific time period, and then it just blew out of proportion, and then went to other places of the world. So. Um, and, and then the context changes, obviously. Um, and so it was meant for that particular time. And of course, there were so many barbarians back there. There were so many, uh, you know, crimes happening. So, so the way that they put a moral law is that if you if you steal from someone, someone we will cut your hand off. And that was that became the Sharia law. But to imply that now in our existing society is just out of proportion because. Um, we're not the same people. Of course, barbarics, um, barbarians exist in our society, but uh, we have different laws for them. Um, so, I mean, I mean yeah, it, it has to be in the context. So, uh, Doctor, when you say that, uh, you know, you've been trying to make some neurological models, mm-hmm. do you think that uh, you have reached a state where you can say that, okay, I have a very strong model and if I am able to apply this on a decent chunk of population, I can actually predict that who are the people who are most probable to be violent. 
Uh, have you reached that stage or have I oversimplified a bit? No, 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 you haven't so much. I mean, it's, it's good that you put this out. I have uh, come down to a, to a model. I've developed the model successfully. Uh, we're testing that model. Uh, we are we've, we've close to testing uh, more than 50 people now. Um, wow. And uh, we've, we've basically isolated the different mechanisms of people who become violent in the state of an appetitive aggression way, which is where this rewarding type of violence. And then how do they believe when we are put them, we're putting them in this um, situation where they they are allowed to become violent in a retaliatory way, right? When they, if they, if they give something, some physically painful or, you know, uh, physically hurtful stimulus to the other person, they get it back too. So, so there, we have established those models. Um, uh, we have, uh, you know, done a lot of the psychiatric testing in them and the, the, reason the reason is um uh, for that is uh, you know is that these people that i had started to work in and i thought we would only find a smaller number of people who would be highly aggressive and um highly violent and and and, and i I've, I've actually had a rude shock after testing a bunch of these people because they knew that this was a part of this was a part of a, a behaviors, you know, like interaction where they were not going to be judged. They were going to hurt people in real life. They were going to receive physically painful things in real life. I mean, we can't reproduce a model of violence in our lab, but what we call is aggression because that's something that we can um, uh, quantify, right? Um, so the times that people, the 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 number of times a person gives a physically painful stimulus to the other person is quantified. And in this model, um, because they know that nobody's going to judge them, uh, and this is an experiment, but an experiment with real consequences, they, they um, even the healthy people, engage in a lot more violence than I thought they would. And that is such an intriguing thing because... Um, when we take away the blame game or the guilt or the judgment around it, a lot of people actually enjoy doing that. And that's one of the saddest things. Yes, not everybody engaged in aggression, but people, most people think how much that they can get away with. And if they can get away with it, they will engage in aggression. Um, and a large amount of people will engage in this fascinating, rewarding violence than the other way around. It's just that um, you know, sense would take over in real life situations because there will be consequences of it uh, and they would rather not. So it's not because of a heightened sense of empathy that they're not engaging in violence. There, there, it's a very complicated process where um, the consequences of um, that also come into the picture. But a lot of people are violent in general. And then there are those who have faced trauma themselves and then they engage in violence which is a different type of pathological violence that i'm studying but these healthy people uh, i think they, they fascinate me a lot more um, but yes the model is there we want to test it in people now we want to test it in people who have more complex um, post-traumatic stress disorders we want to test it in people who have been in combat in the military so, so these models, that, I mean, I can safely say that we've created a model now. We've tested on many people. Um, uh, the most interesting thing that I found after testing is that um, a lot of these people, I thought that a lot of these people would not actually engage in this rewarding type of aggression that, uh, that in, in the model, even because this has real consequences. They were hurting real people. Um, so, so we thought that uh, the healthy people who have no psychiatric disorders or no major psychiatric disorders would not be engaging in them. But we forget that as, long, as, as soon as we remove the consequences, we remove the judgment uh, aspect of it, where the society can condemn something um, and make them or label them a, a terrorist or, or any of that. As soon as we remove that aspect of, a lot of people do enjoy in aggression in day-to-day -day violence. I mean, we've seen such violent video games um, being very popular 
Um, and the people who often go out in the streets shooting, I mean, you know that the, the guy who shooted the Christchurch mosque. Christchurch. Um, yeah. It seemed like almost like a video game to him. And it seemed like he had a lot of practice doing that. Um, yeah. So, so violent video games, and there's a lot of research around why violent video games can actually lead to real world violence, but in some specific type of people, not everybody, obviously, but it makes you practice for combat in a specific way that you shouldn't be. <laughs> um, you know, you're, you know, the rules are different from people who are uh, civilians and from people who are, who are actually in the military. So, uh, you're learning for combat in a specific way, and if you're not, you know, if you're if you're a mother or father of a young teenage kid, and you see that there is some radical aspects in in that person, in that child or teenager, um, and whether it's a son or a daughter, uh, um, and then you see them excessively practicing a specific type of um, or playing a specific type of game, I would be really worried. Um, I think all parents of children uh, who are teens and adolescents should be worried and keep an eye on them and see what what their internet is like, and especially, uh, you know, what sort of things that they go on. It's extremely hard because internet gives so much anonymity. Uh, there are these Reddit forums and all sorts of things, but that alone is not going to make them violent. And what will is something that can be determined from the paradigm, such as what I have. Um, because the, the, people realize that in the games that they're not they're not actually punishing anybody they're not hurting someone but in in the game that we've um, developed here in Sweden um, they they will and they know how much painful that could be but yet they go ahead and give those um, painful uh, stimulus so so that's that's when we know that they're they're actually engaging in that and then we're measuring all sorts of other things that tell us that they're actually enjoying doing what they're doing. And I, and I was surprised to see that a lot of the healthy people were doing this, uh, enjoying the type of um, appetitive or compulsive violence that they were engaging in. Um, and, and that was a complete shock to me. And uh, so, so me- even mental health has to take kind of a different turn where you know, most people think that all these people who go out on the street and do these certain things must be mentally, um, uh, you know, unhealthy. But now it is possible that some people are absolutely mentally healthy. Of course, it is a mental health question, but our, our measures of mental health right now have not been able to cope with measuring what those people who engage in violence are going through. And I think it needs to advance to a point that we include that that heightened state of um, uh, state aggression, which is not trade. It's not, every, they're not like every day. They're not aggressive on a day-to-day basis. They're, they're just violently aggressive on a specific situation, a specific time. And and we, we have to, the research has to come to that point um, where we identify those things. But we, we are, we are quite um, close to having our model and hopefully it will get published soon. Doctor, I just want to, you know, you mentioned that, the many people that you're researching are also, you know, under a favorable condition that they know that they won't be judged. And, uh, you know, and that is the reason they may act in a certain way, uh, which, which made me, you know, recall this very interesting experiment, uh, in 1974. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have heard about this Yugoslavian experiment by Marina Abramovich, where, you know, mm-hmm. she's practically, yeah, for six hours, she said that anybody can do anything to me. Yeah. And uh, correct. Yeah. So it, it's something similar, right? And then people did terrible things to her. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. And, 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 and the conclusion was that, you know, it shows how fast a person can hurt under favorable circumstances. Absolutely. And, uh, and it also shows how one provides the stage. The majority of normal people apparently can become truly violent i mean if if they know that nothing is going to happen to them and they will not be judged yeah. under the moral code they they, are, they tend to become more violent is 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 it a is is this still valid and is it a fair you know conclusion yeah, it is it is i mean and and the, the the cool thing about doing uh scientific research or biological research is that we can go back and produce uh you know we we can say that humans guide their behavior uh, using, um, you know, 
things like judgment or consequences and morality and impulsivity. But the, the, the cool thing is that you can go this and reproduce this model in, in a smaller mammal, like a monkey or a mice or a rat uh, in the lab. That uh, and, the, and you can control for all sorts of uh, situations from gender to even the genetics of the mammal and then make them go through the same type of behavior, introduce, say, a subordinate mice um, uh, in the cage of a dominant mice, and make, uh, you know, the dominant mice feel slightly threat- threatful. But it, we, even then, we know that the subordinate mice will never be able to take over the dominant mice cage because the mice is way too big. Uh, the, you can see the fascinating interaction in, you know, of this violently aggressive behavior, and we can measure um, so many you know, different um, proteins and genes and, uh, you know, and the brain regions that get activated. And, and then when we see the regions of the humans who engage in this behavior with all the context that you just talked about, uh, you know, the, the, the judgment or, or, you know, the guilt and all of that, and we, we, we include the context from the humans and we see the areas of the mice who were doing what they were doing uh, and then compare the areas of the brain that the 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 humans showed lit up during uh, an MRI scan or something, they were practically the same areas. And and sometimes you wonder that it is actually an inherent part of your biology to be this violently aggressive. It's just it's just controlled in certain situations and with the civilization and you know and controlled for because of the consequences and some people will still bypass that and you know be the way that they are and then we call them terrorists or you push someone to a certain extent and make them such disillusional that they will become someone like that i mean when you're saying an entire state is a radical, you know, what do you mean by that? Um, you know, how can an entire community belonging to a certain religion or, uh, you know, an entire state, which if it's been put under lockdown, they cannot be all terrorists, right? Um, it's been happening since months now, since August 5th. Um, you know, so what's what's the deal there? You know, why is why are there so many terrorists from one, one place? Um, you know, versus another. I mean, I'm pretty sure and there's was, there was another terrorism researcher uh, who's actually in the U.S. She's a professor in Washington, D.C. She went to Palestine, um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and she was like, she was being treated badly by the Israeli authorities. And she's like, if I would stay there, I was pretty sure I'd become like that um, after a while because I'm not used to challenging my authority in this specific way it's humiliating to go through that every single day um so but there'll be still some people who not become like that there'll still be some people who would become like that so what's their divide you know of course the entire state is not like that so what you know what how what defines those differences um, and that's where that's why a lot of these mice and um, mammals the models that we we can use to kind of define um, or inform us um, of these um, uh, different molecular processes in the brain and, and, and make us understand what actually goes in the mind. So, I mean, it's 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 um, it's naive to think that uh, a lot of this is not part of your biological process. Um, like, I'm not sure if I've answered your question again. No, you have. Uh, tell me, doctor, do you do you trust? Uh, you know the current world governments with this model or do you think you can massively misuse it um government what do you mean by that i mean if you if you probably give a tool to a government where which can you know which can help them predict that what are the who are the potential civilians who can engage in radical activities right. uh, do you think they will use it to actually serve humanity or they might use it to serve their narrative i'm not sure i think these things have to be closely closely monitored by scientists um, you can't just give this t- a tool to a government and just expect they're not going to misuse it um um, but you know and or not follow follow all the protocols of it when i say this is the biological roots of violent behavior a lot of the people take this also as is this eugenics because eugenics was based on the same idea that certain genes inherited by only some population 
in Europe were more prone to violent behavior than others, and that's why they needed to be removed from the civilization. And that's a very bad idea. And a lot of the science based around this can be misused in that direction. And it has. It has. History says that it has. If you read this really popular book by Angela Saini, um, uh, Superior, it's called, we will we, see a lot of this uh, race science or this just exploring how races are different genetically has been um, kind of a, a, a vehicle for um, these eugenistic ideas. And a lot of the scientists were actively engaging to invest uh, in these ideas, um, some of them employed by Hitler himself uh, back then, but then it just continued on. And it wasn't just about employed by the Nazis anymore. It was just inherent to, to certain white male scientists in Europe, UK and the US uh, to, to investigate more about eugenics. So this happens all the time. And I'm afraid this could happen. It could go terribly wrong. Um, but as long as uh, these protocols have been closely monitored with respect to the scientific evidence and not just taken one thing out and just used that one thing. I mean, I do not believe that even brain imaging alone can be the answer to it. It has to be a combination of all the critical tools of the biology that I work with. And um, um, fMRI is not a tool. I mean, there is an organization in the UK who's just scanning the brains of the radicals and asking whether they would be willing to go for jihad or not. And then they're suggesting that we can know so much about the terrorists from the, the brains of these people. I do not agree to that because... They are just thinking that they will go for jihad if they're asked to, but they're not actually doing it. There's a huge difference between me saying mm. I want to do this versus I will actually do it. Um, so this, so th that happens constantly. Uh, there's also a, a guy in Texas that I know um, in Austin. He has a huge MRI machine in the back of his big truck, and he goes from prison to prison. He's a scientist as well, and I met him in Paris two years ago in a conference, and uh, he basically has a huge MRI device. Uh, but his philosophy is very simple. He doesn't talk about uh, the very nuanced way of like violent extremism or terrorism. Um, he he determines through an MRI scan whether um, uh, someone has uh, his frontal lobe or frontal temporal lobe injured to a specific point where they will have a pathological type of aggression. And if they're in prison, they're likely to be there because of some violent act that they've done because of the way their brain is. And so that those people don't get an early release and you know this it's so much more complicated it's slightly kind of controversial as well because of the way it's working um like if they're given 10 years in prison they he makes sure that they remain there because nobody gets hurt because at the end of the day there is no um no treatment for these things you know the guy that i talked about who committed suicide who was a nazi and who had stabbed a couple of people because who had this accident and then he had a brain injury uh, he would want to keep those type of people in prison for longer if they would go in prison. Now, the guy who committed suicide, he was lucky that he wasn't in Texas when he went to prison. But if he had been in Texas, he would probably be commit, uh, be in for the majority of the time that um, that uh, he was given. So, so all these things have been happening in the rest of the world. Uh, I have my reservations to it, and I don't understand the uh, the bureaucratic side to it at the moment of of what he is doing. Uh, there is the scientist in, in Texas, um, and I would be also very scared that something like this would be misused in one way or another. Um, if if it was given to a government or a military organization, that's why we have um, scientists who are actually overseeing these kind of things. I mean, I am about to start this in um, a, a group of um, um, uh, soldiers who have come back from Iraq. Uh, this is uh, a Veterans Affairs uh, uh, hospital in the US, and they have PTSD and they have other different problems. And I want to see how how is their violent behavior or their 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 
the propensity to engage in violence. And, uh, um, you know, that project is overseen by a lot of scientists and doctors and, you know, health workers. So if you have that kind of evidence-based approach, when you actually engage scientists to run and see over the project, then you're less likely to fail at it. If it's just handed over to a government and they just, you know, with their superficial understanding of the research, they use it for their own benefit. I think that can be very damaging. I'm, sure, mm. I'm not sure if I'm clear about this, but... No, no, you're very, very clear. And yes, I mean, definitely, uh, we all should be very, very concerned about such technology getting into the hands of the wrong government. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the government uh, in the, and not the government in particularly, uh, I think a very senior officer um, of the Indian military was giving a talk in Raisina 2020 this year in January, and I was also there. Uh, in the audience, and he said that in we have these de-radicalization camps, camps, in camps. Uh, and I yeah. was really interested because I have been following the de-radicalization camps across the world for a very long time, and I, I've I've known about the camps in Turkey, I've known about China. Pakistan in uh, China. No, that the China one is not a de-radicalization camp. It's 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 like a hammer camp. It's it's just for a specific type of people who are probably not radicals at all. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, and there, you know, there, there's, I mean, there's a lot of people who, um, uh, who go to this uh, camp uh, and this is some by Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, they go to this camp from, uh, from government, from the so so the American military uh, has picked up some Al Qaeda people, and then they go to Guantanamo. And the Saudis pick only the ones who are in Guantanamo who are of Saudi origin out, and then they put them in their own de-radicalization camps and try to sell them a non-peaceful version of religion. Uh, so they, there are different ways that all people all over the world use. And there's one in Pakistan who's run by the uh, Pakistani military, funded by the Americans. And I don't know what's the what's the um, deal uh, now uh, with, with that particular Pakistani camp. It was in Sawat because Pakistan has reduced the funding. Uh, but I'd like to know more about that as well. But it's it's just that I've been following these things and nowhere nobody has mentioned the Indian camp. Not even the the min- military people themselves who I've spoken with, uh, some uh, officers from the Indian military that I directly spoke with, they they think that there's no such camp which exists. And, and I was kind of a little surprised to see that he said that. So if there is one, I would uh, want to see what they do there, what what methods are they using uh, to to do de radicalization? And, and, um, and I'm not sure if it's working or not, but uh, um, yeah, I would, I'd like to see what that is. Do you think we actually have a camp, or do you think that is you uh, well, know, just my a narrative? That there isn't. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they're running something behind um, closed doors, um, and maybe they're if they are running one behind closed doors, maybe it's not worth putting out in 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 front of everyone um, because of the methods they might be using to de-radicalize them. I'm not sure. It, it is all a speculation. Um, uh, you know, it, because the, the other groups, uh, uh, the other de-radicalization camps um, have been successfully de-radicalizing uh, a lot of the militants and they were, uh, they, they had their policies pretty laid out and they were quite open to um, to have other people come and do reporting or research. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure of, of the Indian one at all. To be honest, this was the first time I'd heard it, and I was pretty surprised. Hmm. Doctor, what is the reason why? You know, the, I, what I could, you know, with your discussion with you, I could feel that when all these things begin with a very strong sense of association with a particular community or a religion, and uh, you know, I see it. Uh, across the political spectrum uh, here in India as well, that people have suddenly this very strong sense of community and religion, not, you know, in the past few years or so, but it has always been there. So my question is, why do people associate so much with the community? Um, Yeah, because humans are very social people uh, and uh, their sense of 
identity and community is very strong and they find the purpose through their their purpose of the life through their identity and community and you um, may meet a lot of people who are in these extreme organizations i've met a lot lot of nazis who are actually not religious i've met a lot of uh, these um, far right uh, hindu hindutva um, activists or i wouldn't say um they're no they're not all terrorists but there are some radicals and some terrorists and a lot of them are not religious either I and mean, you would meet a lot of uh non-religious or atheist uh hindutva radicals who believe in the community believe in the purpose of the hindutva but they don't believe in the in in religion or organized religion per se um it's not uncommon um as long as there is a sense of community which makes them feel belong which validates their beliefs um makes them feel a part of the mainstream um i think that that's uh, and i mean i i feel like as a scientist we don't fit anywhere <laughs> neither in our communities neither outside and we feel that the larger global scientific community is where we feel belonged and that's that's our community and i mean i could be wrong um but uh, you know it's uh, the, the sense of family or belonging somewhere the sense of belonging is very strong and and we feel um the need to find that safety and security through that community in one way or another i mean the the camaraderie or the brotherhood feeling uh, it doesn't nothing kind of tops that once you have this sense of community um in terms of your you know the the rewards that you get in in your brain like you you really you you really um get a high um when you feel you know welcomed or um you know accepted and and nothing can beat that and once you have that you don't want to let go of it and that's why a lot of people find themselves ending up in cults you know because they make them feel special like you are the chosen people you belong mm, to correct and you are special and uh, that is a high of a different type and you are all exactly the same regardless of the race or religion or gender um and and religion's one of the biggest groups that kind of binds people together but if you're not a part of religion you could be a part of anything else um so so i i think uh, i mean it's 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 not it's not always religion it could be anything um but as long as the the cults or the organizations or the ideologies are not engaging in hurting other people i think it could be okay i mean and and hurting i don't mean literally hurting my area is just physical violence but it could be economically hurting it could be uh, you know hurting in different ways um, as well mm. i i understand and i mean i can relate to it because uh, you know when we used to be part of protests and instantly you would feel that everybody belongs to a common sense of purpose and uh, the sense of brotherhood sort of prevails at that protest site because you know everybody is for each other so i think that that's that i mean that's also a certain sense of community that we would be experiencing that time yeah absolutely i mean if you see a lot of the expats who leave india they go outside and um out of india and they bind to other people from south asia even though india and pakistanis and bangladeshi would be fighting with each other correct, um, correct they all bind because they speak the same language and they are they are like brothers and uh, back in south asia it's more about uh, 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 animosity animosity yes absolutely i mean it's the same i mean uh, you can take uh, someone out of uh, you know the same like something like bengal uh, across the border there is a different type of religion but they speak the same language and they have more affinity with each other um, than uh, with someone else um, outside of um, you know outside that culture i mean that common bengali culture or the common punjabi culture unites them uh in some way or another i mean i feel the same about gujarat i mean um i feel more strongly about a gujarati culture because that's that's you know my background but uh um because but but then doesn't mean that i might be able to relate with someone with um who's in pondicherry or like guwahati like i, I don't know that culture so i you know the the sense of culture is still uh the, the it's it's very regional uh, but what what populist government do is they try to unite them under the one 
bigger majoritarian culture and they just they feel that all the other cultures do not matter as much um and, and pakistan has been doing that you know successfully for many many years as well uh that majoritarian punjabi culture is, is the one that prevails isis does that um the 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 majoritarian uh, stronger or more um conservative version of islam is the only culture that they want um and and in general they feel that um in pakistan does that too they they feel that all the other cultures should disappear and only they should only combine or or um it relate to the single muslim uh, islamic or muslim culture in in the country and whether you're a balochi or or a pashto or a sindhi they want to kind of remove those aspects of your ideology this is how they want to unite um people in pakistan and and, and isis works in the same way and i think india is also doing that, something like that in a similar way you, you lose your sense of identity but you you know you, you put that aside and you just want to be uh, in indian in a way um and and that's how the majority in culture is taking over and whoever is whichever is the majority in india will eventually become the the larger culture of india uh, i mean that's that's what their idea is I, i'm hoping that wouldn't happen and i'm hoping that uh, <laughs> that the different cultures of india are preserved in their own ways and Uh, you know a, a single language doesn't take over or or um or you know as, as you might be familiar with the hindiization of the nation um pakistan's done something similar and all these little languages that they had in in the past they they're all gone now um which is very sad um and so i i i've hardly met anybody uh who is from the kashmiri part of uh, um of uh, pakistan who actually now mostly speak just kashmiri there i mean they've all become urdu so it's an urduization of pakistan but it's it's the same happening with hindi india and hindi now i guess mm i i somehow feel uh just taking you know a slight turn here uh but but i somehow feel that uh, or i question that how did we end up here i mean uh mm-hmm. Uh, the rise of far right and the rise of the majority in culture or the nationalist culture uh, uh, although in 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 sync across the world and you know you might have you you you, you must be men, you know witnessing something in europe as well yeah. uh, it's 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 absolutely surprising it somehow makes me question that i think somehow the libertarian left has failed in the past few decades and or years or something has gone wrong Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, if Afghanistan wouldn't have happened uh in this way, uh, you know, uh, we wouldn't be here. Or there could be other reasons. Um, everybody has a different um view on why the the general left failed. Um it had become more um dictatorial than it should have been. And there could be other things, but but there these comes these things come in cycles. Like there was um in liberalism before and then people became more socialist and then now we have the far right and then as people will f- question the m- problems of the far right we will go towards on the left and then when people get too comfortable with their um and you know with with whatever left gives them and then they will go back to the same also it, it is cycle it comes and goes and um but the problem is that <laughs> It, the the bad cycle stays for much longer because things have the to go the damage really, is done yeah the things have to go really bad for them to get better again like people didn't come out, out on the streets when 2002 happened in this way they only came out on the streets when the entire muslim population has faced a chance that they might become non citizens of india and uh, and people should have stopped them even a lot of the people who voted um um the current government in power in 2014 now have problems with him um in the second uh, election that he had so um people did not know enough and i think there's a problem of also information they did not have enough information and our media has wholly to be blamed on it um to whitewash some of the crimes that uh these people might have committed but but the, the whole general trend comes and goes it is very interesting when i moved to australia i was placed from a very very heterogeneous society in a way that 
I did not know anybody who was Muslim who was my friend. I grew with non-Muslims and uh, that was the culture that I knew and that was something that I associated myself with. I had never known what it's to live like in a only Muslim culture. And I had the rudest, uh, um, you know, experience of my life when I was placed from that India that I grew up in and I loved and I understood to come to a place where uh, the the area that I lived in was a Turkish ghetto. And um, this was the same time when Erdogan came in full power from um, from a long period of um, uh, Turkish politics that was mostly liberal or mostly imposed form of liberalism. And then when it was the same time, I think it was 2002, 2004, Erdogan came into power, he became the mayor of, uh, mayor of Istanbul and then uh, became the prime minister and now the president. Uh, and the, the Turks who were living in that area that I was living in when I moved to Australia, they were, they had all escaped the very um, imposing form of liberal regime back then. Uh, you know, this, and this was coming on from the Ataturk and, you know, all those uh, other political leaders. And uh, Ataturk basically, I mean, they, those guys even banned a scarf in their parliament. That was back then. And now um, Erdogan's daughter, uh, whose name incidentally happens to be Sumaya as well, now she's a big political figure and wears scarves everywhere, headscarves. But but um, that th- that time, uh, the people moved out of Turkey who actually wanted to practice that this more religion, their religion, their religion. Culture. yeah. And then they some of them moved to Australia, and then there was this area where I was living in, where that was the majority of the people. Now I am essentially coming from 2002 Gujarat to Erdogan's Turkey in a week's time. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was the biggest like change in my, in, in my life. And, 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 uh, and that, that's when I could see like the two extreme comparisons of two different cultures and what this could add. And that's why, you know, I started questioning some of the things that has led to become uh, the, the, what I am now today. But yeah, it was, it was, funny in a way that how uh, different countries moved into a different political sphere at the same time, roughly around the same time. Doctor, what is the science behind empathy? And I often see that uh, the people's empathy is not uh, consistent. It is, uh, it's very selective. It is selective basis gender. It is selective uh, basis ideology it is selective basis religion uh, to, to give you an example people would not empathize with uh, some and i'm talking about both sides some people would not empathize with a certain section of religious communities who who were badly hurt during the delhi riots uh, and some people would uh, so th- that's a very big question and a sense of confusion in my head uh, what is what is the science behind it yeah, so there's too too many questions in in a single question. Um, but uh, <laughs> essentially, uh, empathy is empathy is processed in the same areas of the brain, um, which came from an evolutionary perspective, came much later to mammals. Uh, and the primary, um, you know, n- non-human primates in particular did not have the same sense of empathy as humans did. Uh, they did but not in the same way. And now what we have where the where this emotion is um, um, is processed in the brain is, is actually the same area or similar, you know, the, the same areas of the brain where uh, uh, these impulsivity um, that I was talking about earlier um, uh, in the frontotemporal lobe, um, this impulsive type of behaviors are, are processed. And because they are, much later, um, uh, you know, they, they came much later in the evolutionary processes. Um, they are connect homes with the more primal areas of the ba- brain that have been existed in um, mammals throughout the evolutionary history of humans. Uh, they are kind of far away from there, and their connect homes are not direct. They con- they talk to those more deeper areas of the brain through multiple junctions. 
So em- empathy as a primal emotion doesn't come to you straight up. It's not like a fight or flight response. It's it's not immediate. Like you have to, th- it takes time to, for you to think through what, um, you know, for who and why and what you'll have, you know, what type of empathy you'll have for a specific person or an or a non-human or an object or, or you know wherever your empathy lies so um so it doesn't come as the first response um but having said that um people have this differential empathy i mean hitler had a dog um who he was you know very loving towards um and a lot of these <laughs> Uh, these type of people who had a very bad history of empathy, such as Hitler, um, have had uh, animals throughout their life and they've been very loving towards them. Um, the guy that I, who I met in Gujarat, he was very loving towards his dogs. He had a lot of dogs too. And at that time, that something clicked and I thought immediately about Hitler's dog because <laughs> because he he specifically wanted to put out this uh aspect of him that he is very loving towards his dogs and there is no better love than loving animals and you would see a lot of the vegetarians uh, uh, uh the extreme vegetarians i would say the militant versions of them behave like that too like the pita for example they will put humans and 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 women in particular naked um you know painted with some red color to look like they're they're bleeding in the same uh, uh packets where we get chicken uh with and seal them with a plastic uh, translucent plastic uh foil and um and present it in public space to make them look like look this is how the chicken that you buy from I mean they are also living creatures but that's not the same thing as putting women in there right and um and so people mm. have very different versions of what empathy is uh, for a normal person that would be absolutely insane to put actual humans in the same way as they are but for some people animals treated that way is you know far more worse than treating human that way so it is fascinating to see where your empathy lies but it depends what's the negative emotion that you've given to a human or a specific group of humans um uh, at any given point in time so you you may have dehuman you know this, this word is i hate this word dehumanization it's not dehumanization of a of a group of people um you can you can understand you you know you can take cognizance of the fact that the other person is human but you still want to behave in a certain way because it's not your type of human. The, the your type of human um, doesn't deserve the same treatment, but as long as it's not your type of human, this is a different type of human. It's still a human, but it's the type of human that it doesn't deserve to be treated well. Um, and, and as long as that is established in your brain, you can, you can pretty much do anything uh, to that human. So, you know and and how do you establish that through information you 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 see uh in you know people hearing all sorts of things on whatsapp that uh, a group of people you know engage in violence rape your women do all sorts of things and then you think that okay these type of humans belonging to this group or community are not my type of humans and then on the basis of that information i would want to put them in the category where it's okay for them to face this type of violence it's i mean i'm trying to make it simple but obviously it's not that simple um, no but it's making a lot of sense that's how people think yeah please go on yeah so that's that's how they come to the conclusion obviously and and that's why the role of misinformation in politics is super important because this is how day in day out of sending violent videos that are saying that these other type of humans are doing these terrible things to your type of humans every single day on whatsapp on twitter um works towards creating that type of a negative affect or negative emotion um yet you would see that and say ha huh, this other group of people are behaving unjustly and doing all sorts of silly things i don't like these people sure i would wish um violence upon them but am i going to do it myself maybe not 
there will be those specific type of people who would want to do that. So the the, the fence sitters in the country who don't um, who don't have a specific uh, um, affiliation with the political party, you know, might think that oh, it's probably better to have these citizenship laws, whatever. You know, uh, I, I know some of these people have been doing some of these things because of the misinformation that they've seen on WhatsApp, and uh, uh, and and they w- they would believe that this is okay for these other group to experience this, these things, but they're not going to go on and take a gun and shoot people there at the protest sites. So, you know, that, you know, so, so empathy for, for wishing something upon somebody and empathy for actually doing something as a part of their behavior are, are completely different things. So of course it's way more complicated than that, but, but I'm trying to find out who makes that jump and what creates that jump between one to another. So is it possible for people to develop empathy uh, and especially if they have crossed a certain age? Um, yeah, of course it is. Uh, they just have to be retrained. Uh, it is, again, I told you, it is like addiction. You can get addicted to something and then you can get rehab to take yourself out of addiction. So... Um, if you were being conditioned to think that these different group of people deserve all of these terrible things um, that are happening to them, then you could also be conditioned to think that, ah, but these people are actually a part of the group that you are in, and they are not these others that you wish all these different things on. And once they have established that, that they they have some relatedness towards them i mean the majority of the people don't know minorities in india like they they don't have interactions with them on a day-to-day basis mm, and, nothing i mean yeah yeah the ones who do they are like oh this is not that type of muslim so yeah i, I remember that happened to me all the time because i was like the only mm. one there. you are different <laughs> yeah i'm different you are a- yeah, different because yeah. you don't conform to that stereotype. And a lot of my Muslim friends have expressed this, and I have seen that that the majority of Muslim bias in India is uh, with people who do not have Muslim friends. I mean, they might have one or two. They may know some vendors who are Muslims, and you know, they may know some you know their day to day work with them, but they they do not sit with them and they talk and they hang out. Yeah, not in the same way. But as but but then if the, if they do. Uh, if they do meet some of them and they do have those people in their lives, they think of them as their own or belonging to their own group. I'll give you two examples. There was one guy who was um, an enabler. He participated in the Naroda Patia riots, but his wife was actually Muslim. Now, he had been a part of the mob and lynched people. He doesn't even remember what he did. Um but he did confess that he had he did go on a killing spree and did all sorts of things during the 2002 Naroda Party riots. And he 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 married a Muslim woman, but he loved her a lot. But at the same time, he, his justification was that he wanted to teach um, her a lesson. And then he was really brutal um, uh, and violent towards his wife. He he would engage in domestic violence all the time. Um, but at the same time, he he married her too. Like, would you marry the other, like someone from the other community to teach them a lesson? Like, that was just a very conflicted response from him. But he, you know, it's not like he never had Muslim friends. He had a wife who was Muslim. Secondly, the the, the guy that I met, um, the uh, the guy from Bagrangal, he said that when he went to prison after the riots, he did go to prison, spent about fourteen months there. Uh, his best friend in the prison was another, um, another like a local Gunda type person, who was actually a Muslim guy. But he related to him and nobody to else because he saw as the same personality of power, of assertions and confidence as him. Because he was very, he was very confident. He thought he was one of the most powerful guys in the in in the area. He could do practically anything and get away with it. Very charming, and he could influence a lot of people in the way he would speak. So he found someone similar like him and the entire bias around religion went out of the window. And he was still the closest friend of this guy in the prison. 
So he's like, oh, but you know, I'm not against Muslim. I have the best Muslim friends. Um, it's I feel like the same justification is given by homophobes when they say, oh, I have I have gay friends. I'm not I'm not against gay people. Um, but but it's 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 a myth that they don't have any Muslims. It's true that they they've they've been seeing less and less Muslims in the mainstream now than before. But uh, even when they do, they put them those other Muslims in their own groups, some social or any any group that they think of that they belong to. Because we're not always in one group. You're not always just a Muslim or a Hindu. You're too many things at the same time. And as long as somebody fits in one of those groups one, and they become one of their own, it could be an exception. But then, Doctor, what is the solution to the gaps that, the invisible gaps that uh, historically we have been witnessing between different communities, whether they're whites or blacks in um, US or, you know, Hindus and Muslims and Christians in India or Shias and Sunnis. I mean, I, and I know that there is no simple answer to this, but, but, you know, it is time that we start questioning, um, you know, how do we become more civilized society? And to become a civilized society, I think it is important to fill in those gaps. And I can't think of ways. Can you? Um, again, you're right. It's not that simple. Um, but I think there is a start to it. We should stop making, um, you know, violence as a day-to-day solution to many problems. Like, uh, this is something that I've been discussing with a lot of my friends, including Pratik, who works with misinformation. And we often talk about how misinformation contributes to violence. We're actually working on a research project together uh, to explore this, and the different incidences of violence, including specifically lynching. Uh, and even those that are not um, political uh, acts of violence, such as those child kidnapping rumors where the, the so some uh, uh, poor people who got lynched and died because they thought they were child kidnappers. Uh, there was like rumors on WhatsApp. So uh, we're, we just have created the society where everybody's on the edge, on the brink, and a little explosion of our smallest firecracker would agitate so many people. And in the fear, they would just go on and act on yeah, and, and, and engage in certain acts of violence. I think if we use um, nor if you, we've, we've normalized violence to the point that everything, including our movies, our political speeches, our you know speeches for valorism or whatever there is virtue in, it revolves around violence, and in, and that's like that's the only like virtue that we have. Like everything, why is everything about uh, Maro Kato, and you know why is everything about that? Why could we not just talk down like actual people, you know, and, and and sit down and talk about and solve our problems? I think that's that's one of the biggest downsides that South Asian um, countries have had. It, it was all, I mean, nothing is resolved without violence. It's always been that way. Um, you know, whether you want to have elections or whether you want to, um, you know, convince some group of people that you are uh, or uh, an ethnicity that you are a part of this country and not the neighboring country. It's always been with violence. This, this is no, there's no peaceful process to it. Uh, whether you want to win elections right before and after, you can have all sorts of incidences. And, um, and I think that that's really tragic. And we've just made it so normal. Um, um, so I, I think that's one of the biggest problems. And once we solve those problems, then maybe, and then factfulness is a bigger problem. We, you know, we, we have a huge problem with being factual. And I, we, me, me, we, I mean our race in general. And I'm not generalizing um, Indians or uh, or someone else. You know, humans, we, we have a general problem with factfulness because it's often easy information to consume. Uh, there are no nuances. You you need to work your brain harder to understand something. And if you already have a certain set of ideas into your mind and your bias works to kind of reinforce those ideas, you only see that black and white. And then you just accept that information. And that's what happens with most news. Um, some news, in fact, reinforces those biases. 
um, and work towards creating those simplified black and white biases. And if you do it for a certain number of period, what we have is what you see now. Um. Now, Doctor, there's one phenomena that I have seen around the, the community circles, friends, families, extended families. Uh, and, and I absolutely fail to understand is, number one, if if there is a situation when there is an aggressor and and there is somebody who is oppressed uh there is often the association is with the aggra- aggressor and uh the, even in cases like rape there the, there is very easy victim blaming uh that it is the victim's fault why yeah. you know she was at certain place uh and even in you know, when we are talking about the protest or the riots i see uh people affirming to you know the the viewpoint of um, you know an aggressor or maybe you know somebody who is more powerful uh, let's say in this case could be a police or the state but they would never have a viewpoint or you know they would never sort of have a support to the one who is oppressed and i absolutely cannot understand this phenomena and it's widespread uh is there a science behind it or it is is it's just like a cognitive bias where they want to support something so they will support it no there is no science behind it i think it's it's all coming down to information what sort of information that they are consuming uh what are the bubbles as they say of their social media groups that they are subscribing and the, if they are doing it over and over or for a longer period of time and they f- see everybody feels that they are a victim okay you think that you know one group is a victim because you were standing in protest for support um for their support but you know the other people could be feeling that oh the the policeman is actually from you know someone who supports my ideas and um, there was one policeman who got brutally injured so i am actually in support of them they completely ignore the other side in in such a way because the information the release of information and again this is this is not just i mean yes the biggest problem is the way our media is operating now um the media is completely one or the other sided often doesn't present uh, 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 views uh, often present news that are devoid of views you know they're always only um you know the information with the underlying context they don't even let you decide what you want to think they just impose that upon you and it is done in such an aggressive way that you don't have the time to decide i mean in the middle there is this you know music drum music playing um, <laughs> that kind of takes away all that space in the middle that you want to read between the lines uh, and and when i and i did not know that there was there was this type of information that we were we were consuming in india because i left you know some time ago and then uh, it, i mean i'm not saying it wasn't there back then but it wasn't to this extent and then when i went and saw news in other countries it wasn't this loud this over the top and and i think it's a huge difference in the way the news is presented shouting yelling um uh, mostly opinions uh, opinions that are laid out as facts and i, I think it's a problem with the way our information is given the people who are supporting one type or another it's it's where their information is coming from and where their victimhood is um, for and which group are we talking about this is it, it's got nothing to do with science here i think this this is where this is where the politics of misinformation and information come into the picture uh, the propaganda uh, the way that it's driven out I mean, there there are statistics on it. I think there's a couple of researchers who've been working on this: how the misinformation wave increased just around the election time, and we've seen that too in all news, and the type of misinformation that came out around that period. And why does why does misinformation in, increase just around the election? I mean, of course, uh, there are elections to be won. Um, so yeah, yes, the media houses are are to blame, but then there are these citizen journalists or popular people who who dish out everything you know you know you, you must have read about um uh, these actresses and actors who got uh, approached by uh, a yeah, cobra post cobra post yeah i mean 
these things exist and people do take money and make money out of out of these things and, and i think the larger society suffers eventually uh, yeah so it's, i mean i don't know who i don't think it affects them at all um, but uh, but yeah they are indeed suffering someone someone is suffering now but eventually everybody will suffer um, great so doctor we are almost at the end of the podcast right and uh, how long was there is this sorry how long was this supposed to be <laughs> this is like two and a half hours now uh in very honestly i anticipated it two and a half hours okay and uh, so because i you know when i was framing those questions i knew that it's going to take a lot of time to uh, you know cover them and you know uh, thanks for your patience but yes there is one small segment that i run in my show it's when i take questions from listeners and i tell them that this is my next guest right. and uh, then you know they if they have any questions for you so they, you know they 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 shoot some questions so before we conclude i i have some questions for you uh, no. not very very you know very in depth questions like we discussed before uh, but yes indranil uh, wants to know he's from poland he's 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 an indian he lives in poland he said that as a fact checker you might be exposed to a lot of absurd and stupid news so how do you maintain your sanity <laughs> see uh, this is a constant battle i often have to every day go through this many times and justify which which information is worth fact checking sometimes it is so absurd that i feel Uh, degraded to something other than what i am to not a scientist when i feel that okay if i really had to fact check this then i'm we're doomed not me everybody's doomed because i have to fact check this and sometimes i take the opinions of my friends like pratik and he'd be like no but we have to fact check this because it is so popular and that that's when i feel um if it's so popular is it because their people are believing in it or they're just making fun of it um so this is like an everyday struggle which one to fact check and which one to not but i think generally when i try to stay away we talked a lot about religion today but generally we want to stay away from religion when we're fact checking because there is nothing to fact check there we can't find evidence we can fact check only those things that has evidence and we can fact check using anything that that can you know uh, you, you know that that anything with with the um, reliable misinformation uh, reliable information to counter the misinformation that's coming out but there would be so so many things that doesn't have anything to counter and we just let them go so i, I think it's a, it's a struggle it's an everyday struggle uh, things like you know clapping um, since three days i've been told that i should fact check this how do i fact check <laughs> like to take away coronavirus i don't know how to do it and i don't want to do it but it's so viral and and i'm sad that this this is coming down to clapping and i really want to get something oh do you know if this particular drug that has been used in hiv is working in corona or not i would want to do something like that but i'm drowned in these these very um terrible <laughs> piece of misinformation so yeah um, yeah uh, my my dad has couple of questions for you but you know okay. i have shortlisted some okay. and uh, you know uh, so but one thing which he he's really keen to know is what do you think is a reason for political leadership failure in spain and italy to fight corona virus um so with italy so italy has a good um uh public health system right the problem with italy and even spain um they they actually exported a lot more um cases outside than uh, any of the other ones to be honest because um what happened like for example in australia they were quarantining and um uh, scanning everybody who came from china but not from italy and partly that was due to some racism and other aspects as well um but italy has a lot of um travelers uh, for example and and it came the the virus came to italy much sooner i mean there are so many reasons for a virus to thrive it's not just politically there there could be a conflict in the leadership and you know lack of actions um but um, 
but but Italy had a lot of a lot of tourism. A lot of people went and did continue to go uh, much after, um, you know, especially when when the weather was getting better there. Um, a, a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, keep keep going to Italy, and and a lot of people didn't stop. A lot of the governments didn't stop them from um, traveling um, and uh, didn't quarantine their own time. And then it just went, you know, I think until the 29th of February, Italy had low number of cases and then it shooted suddenly uh, up to war- where it is right now. So I think India is right now at that particular time when it is going to go, you know, I think by next Tuesday or Wednesday, we will see a real high of these of these cases and then you know you know we we run run out of things we run out of resources at that point in time so you can't blame the political leadership only i think if india would have done something a week ago um or 10 days ago uh to use evidence-based science to uh, counter um misinformation and uh, uh, test more and more people instead of uh, sidelining those people who had not just travel history uh, but contacts and, and, and milder symptoms, for example, we won't be at this point. We're, we're gone beyond um, testing now, but I think there is still a lot of merit in testing. Um, but but it's not the failure of political leadership um, only that has caused this, um, because Sweden has a lot of evidence based. Um, um, and science and South Korea in the same way. Um, South Korea also had a huge rise, but the rise was still lower than the predicted rise. Had had not South Korea had not tested um, the way that it did. So at one point in time, South Korea and I think they still are testing more than twenty thousand cases a day. And I mean, amping up. So you really need that kind of political leadership that you know takes charge and actually. Um, does something for the impact of it and not not wait until uh, the tide is already reached you know so but in India unfortunately we don't have that uh, but I mean the, the health system is not good enough and it's not just about the health system being, being um, uh, good enough for people the, the disparity from the private and the public health system is so huge and we won't even be able to care for everybody in India and I think that's going to be the biggest problem. They won't be able to afford it. I mean, diagnosis is costing in India. And what if people can't afford diagnosis? Would they just be allowed to go? Um, and if they're going, who are they going to touch in the future, in the next 5, 10, 12 days? Um, I, think it's, it's, I think it's not just about governments right now. It's, it's about what you could have done at what point in time and what resources you had. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 way more complicated than just you know a, a labeling a government to 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 come up to do something. Yeah, but unfortunately, it I don't think uh, a, a high um, touristy place such as Italy or Spain could have saved at this time of the year. I mean, uh, Florida was mm. similar. A lot of the cases in 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 um, uh, the the uh, in the in the United States are east um, coast. Uh, New York and uh, Washington D.C. and they, there are a lot of those are traveler cases, um, uh, and, they, and, and it's not just related to uh, international travel, but also domestic travel. Um, and you can pick it up from airports very easily. So it's, I mean, that, that's, it's just the wrong. It's the wrong time. It's, I think uh, we should stop blaming people and just do what is supposed to do. Uh, and one last question and. Uh... See, we we saw a very interesting movement today. And this is again a question from my dad. And he said that we saw a very interesting movement today where in the country was united, sort of coming out cheering for public health professionals. And we saw this phenomena across religious lines. We saw people doing it uh, despite of their political ideology. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we participated in it as well, etc. So w- what does this tell you? Um, I mean, uh, one part is, did people participate it because do you think they feared uh, or they thought that, you know, was there some FOMO or they, do you think it's, it's, it's difficult to, you know, understand a mass phenomena like this, but 
but it was a very successful event so, so just your thoughts around it are you talking about the forced um, curfew uh, no no yeah the the 5 pm clapping aha the 5 pm clapping um look i mean a, a tragedy unites people right now it's not about religion it's just humanity people from all, all parts of the world are giving their aid to italy um you know even modi had a a conference in the south countries um uh, and and he's to i mean for example it was a good decision to give this specific day off or curfew uh, and you know impose a curfew um for many reasons but i hope that it continues um to stay this way and then you know there is aid given to people who are affected by these curfews um but but it does bring people together tragedy reunites people it makes you rethink you know shakes you to the bottom of your core and makes you rethink who you are if it does shake you at all but more importantly um is a very funny incident by one of uh, the, my department head he's the head of psychiatry uh he's a uh, he's a swede um but he is uh, jewish from um uh, poland uh, his family uh, fled the holocaust and settled in sweden <clears throat> during the world war and uh, he was telling um, us a while ago that uh, i think to unite the human race we need an alien invasion uh, so, <laughs> so so this is how most uh, people think that an external external um, aggressor uh, can unite two people i mean as i said put you earlier uh, when the indians and pakistanis go outside of their countries they are they are together and then suddenly the white person is the other person uh so mm. it's, it's it's always the external aggressor um but uh, and in this instance the virus is the external aggressor um not 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 china as trump puts it but uh <laughs> but uh, the virus itself yeah okay dr sumaya sheik it was an absolute pleasure and an honor to have a discussion with you and i'm so grateful for you to be on the show Pleasure's mine. So this was a two-part special series with Dr. Sumaya Sheikh uh, of the science behind extremism. I hope you guys enjoyed this show. It was a very special show. I again would like to thank Dr. Sheikh for taking out such valuable time of hers uh, for this podcast. If you guys like the show, please tweet to me. Tweet to Dr. Sheikh. Tell her. Uh, what you liked about the show what you did not like about the show and uh, give me a give, give me a feedback on twitter please uh, i am I, my twitter handle is t h o o n e d i t the one that and you know i'm 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 thinking maybe i should also create a twitter handle for lights camera azadi what do you guys think let me know on on a direct message on twitter or a tweet uh share your uh, suggestions or recommendations on my email which is vandit.gen@outlook.com and subscribe to the youtube channel which is lights camera azadi uh great stuff uh, i mean great stuff to like you guys uh, you know you 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 spent two and a half hours plus listening to these two episode so thank you uh have a great day be safe stay indoors dhanyawad jai hind